Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is part two and the conclusion of the fly cutter build. We've got some cool machining techniques to show you and a little bit of metallurgy. So let's dive right in. Yeah, I don't have a funny joke this time. It's just the intro. Sorry. So here's our part where we left it off last time, and uh, I'm setting it up in the mill again, and uh, I'm using a, a parallel to align it to one side of the vise uh, for repeatability, and this actually didn't turn out to be necessary, but it's kind of a habit. Uh, as you'll see here shortly, uh, we actually only need repeatability on the y-axis. Because all of the features on this part extend the entire length of the x-axis, we only need to get the y-axis aligned with the spindle. But that actually turns out to be tricky because the only datum or reference feature that we have on this part is the center bore. But remember that that bore is currently at a 10 degree angle because of the angles that we face to the top and bottom too. So we can't use traditional methods such as an indicator, a test indicator, or a coaxial indicator, or uh, even really a, a standard edge finder to get aligned with that bore. So what we're going to do is use a, a technique for center finding that you don't see often, uh, which is to use the cone end of the edge finder, and we use it with the spindle stationary. So all you do is you offset the cone, and then you bring the part in until you can feel with your fingers that the cone is lined up with the shaft of the indicator. And uh, because those surfaces are so precision ground, you can actually feel just a couple of thousandths of misalignment on those two parts. So if you take your time, uh, and do this carefully, you can get within a thousandth of center by doing it this way. Well, that's all well and good, except that the features that we need to cut are on the other side of the part. Well, uh, that's okay, because the flat sides that we're holding the part uh, are repeatable because we've machined them. So as long as we are careful to only flip the part on the x-axis, end for end, and never front to back, then uh, those reference surfaces are still going to be valid, and the setup will be repeatable on the other side of the part. Tappy tap tap. Now we're going to start by milling the half inch by half inch slot that the tool bit rides in. And uh, so I'm doing this with a quarter inch four flute end mill. Uh, when you need a precision dimension, you don't want to go in with an end mill that's the same size as your slot because slot cutting is always going to end up a little bit oversized. So if you need a precisely dimensioned slot and you want good surface finishes on both sides of that slot, it's good to take a smaller end mill and run it down the middle and then mill the sides of that slot outwards to dimension. Now you might think that this slot is running down the center of the part, but actually one edge of the slot is running down the center of the part, and that's because you want the cutting edge of the tool bit to be on the center line of the fly cutter, uh, so that as it spins, it's at the, the height of the arc of the spin. So uh, that means the whole slot is actually uh, to one side of the center line. Now because I'm struggling a little bit with chip control here, I thought it would be fun to try something different. So this is Anchor Lube. It was in the gift bags from the Barzy Bash, and uh, I've never used it before, so I thought I'd give it a shot. What's interesting about it is that instead of being oil-based, it's actually soap-based. So it's basically high-tech dish soap, and uh, it looks like toothpaste. And uh, what's cool about it is that, as you can see here, it's, it's actually capturing the chips and then the, the paste kind of winds its way up the end mill and it kind of pulls the chips out of the slot. So uh, that was a really pleasant surprise. This stuff's pretty cool. So I've stopped a little bit short of final depth and now I'm side milling to get our width to where we need to be. And the most satisfying part of each pass is backing it up and pushing all the chips out of the slot. So we should have about 20 thou to go here. So I'm putting the tool bit in just to give a little uh, check. And sure enough, we uh, look like we're about 20 thou high. So now I'm just going to go back in and mill that slot a little deeper in two passes. And that's looking really good. It's uh, actually still about three or four thou shallow. And uh, I'm actually going to leave it there because I would prefer to err on the side of being too shallow. Uh, because the base of the fly cutter is very close to the work, I don't want to have any chance of the fly cutter uh, getting too close to whatever you are fly cutting. And uh, the surface finish on the slot came out nice, and I don't want to mess with it, so uh, it's, it's good how it is. And then we've got a very nice, satisfying pile of chips here to vacuum up. So now we're going to work on this feature where the set screws go to hold the tool bit in place. So the first thing we need to do is machine out a flat spot there. 
And of course that flat spot is on the edge of the part and uh, I didn't realize until this moment that my parallels were too short and so I was going to hit the vice jaw if I tried to mill it in this position. So I had to redo my setup uh, with uh, taller parallels and uh, you know it's a pain but uh, here's a little trick to make sure that your uh, parallels are the right height. Just throw your machinist scale on there and make sure that uh, there's enough material sticking above there for the operation that you need to do. Now I've used the DRO to uh, move the end mill to where I think it should be based on doing all the math. Uh, but I always like to do a second sanity check uh, if I can by some other means. So just by setting uh, my calipers to the distance that should exist between the slot and, and the start of our new feature. Uh, if, if it's close, you know, uh, then I can tell that I probably did the math right. Okay, so we know the end mill has to end up with its center at a Y value of 1.125, but uh, we don't know where we're going to start milling from because the end of that part, you know, the rough cut side of it is, you know, could be anywhere in space. So now we can use one of my favorite tricks on the DRO, which is to go into incremental mode so we don't lose our absolute coordinate system. And then we zero out that Y axis. And now we can move the end mill wherever we need to do to do our milling. And we know that we're milling to zero and we'll be at final dimension. Okay, now we can get down to business. And I'm using a half inch roughing end mill here. It's got that corn cob texture. And you can see the kind of interesting uh, stripey finish that it leaves on the, on the part uh, when you're side milling with it. And uh, you may recognize that finish if you look in the dark corners of your inexpensive machine tools. You will see that finish on various machined surfaces. And that's because uh, finishing passes in machining are expensive. And so if you're trying to save money on a budget tool, you leave the roughing pass finish from the uh, roughing end mill. So I stop short uh, about 10 thou on both the width and the depth of this slot. And then I come back in with a finishing end mill and I cut those both of those final two dimensions in one pass and leave a very nice surface finish in both places. And just for extra niceness, I did a climb milling pass with that finishing end mill and that, uh, that tends to leave a little bit nicer finish. Okay, so now we can flip the part back over and again being very careful to flip it along the x-axis so that my reference surfaces are still valid. And uh, now I'm going to go back in and cut the, uh, the uh, weight balancing scallop that we talked about in the first video. And so that was done with the same technique. I go in with the roughing mill and then I finish with the finishing mill. And that's looking quite fine indeed. So now I'm setting it up on the end so that we can uh, make the uh, set screw uh, holes. And to do that I'm just uh, using an indicator to get that top surface flat and I'm just using a screwdriver to kind of twist it, uh, tap it, you know, back and forth until it reads level all the way across. And now I want to find the center line of the row of bolt holes, so I'm edge finding on the two edges, but because these edges are uh, the same, uh, on the same side, I can't just use the half function on the DRO, it's going to be off by half the distance of the edge finder, so I have to go uh, from one edge to the other, have it, and then move in half the diameter of the edge finder, and now I'm on the center line. Now finding my references on the x-axis is a little tricky because there's unmachined round surfaces there, but you know these bolt holes aren't that critical, so uh, uh, what I've done is I've set a quill stop and I'm going down the same depth on each side, and so it'll be reading very close to the same distance away from the finished surface at the top. And so then I can use the half function and uh, it'll tend to cancel out the error introduced by the unmachined uh, factory surfaces that are still on those edges. And then I can go in and center drill in the correct locations as indicated by the DRO. And now I'm going to go in with the tapping size for my set screws which are M8 uh, by 125. And uh, this drill, uh, despite being brand new, the factory grind on it isn't very good. It seems to only be cutting on one flute uh, reliably. I'm not sure why that is. Inexpensive drill, I guess. And then we go in and tap those holes. Once again, A8 by 125. And that fastener size, incidentally, was chosen because it's the same one that my AXA tool holders use for the lathe. So I can use the same Allen key on this as I use on the lathe because I have a million of those Allen keys lying around everywhere, so there will always be one handy. So I'd like to deburr those holes now, and my deburring tool won't fit. Sad face. Well, here's a little alternative. Uh, you can take a largish size drill bit and uh, just stick it in a collet in the mill and then just turn the spindle with your hand and you can use that to chamfer the uh, the holes just like you would with a chamfering tool. 
Uh, the angle won't be the same because of course a drill is 118 degrees instead of 90 degrees, but uh, it still does a decent job. Okay, for extra credit, I'm going to go in and chamfer the edges that we have access to with a two flute carbide chamfering mill. That just gives it that extra little sousson of quality. And then we go down the back side as well. As Tom Lipton would say, this is now a high value part. Okay, now we can go back to the arbor and uh, I mentioned in the first video that we were going to turn that between centers and it's time to do that. So here's a, a little pin that I made uh, that acts as a lathe dog drive pin and it fits into the backing plate that is used on this particular lathe to mount the chucks. It saves me having to put the face plate on or something else just to drive a lathe dog and it stays clear of the spindle nose so there's no risk of damage to that. Okay and then we put our lathe dog on the arbor that we made earlier and you remember we made those centers on both ends so that goes right on the two centers like that and we are ready to turn. Turning between centers isn't something you see a lot uh, nowadays but it's uh, actually the oldest form of metal turning and it is in fact still the most precise because the part is only being referenced to the machine by two points and two points are always a straight line. This is in fact the most uh, repeatable and most precise way to turn metal. Okay, so recall that we're going for 751 here because we want a 2000 press fit on our on our 749 bore. And uh, we're a couple of tenths short, but I'm gonna take that. Now here's the superpower of turning between centers. It's repeatable even if you flip the part end for end, which pretty much no other work holding form is, uh, aside from dialing, dialing it in in a four jaw. So by, uh, because we can flip the part end for end, we can turn the other side and if you're careful, uh, you can turn the other side down to the exact same dimension as the first side. And on the final pass, this is the moment of truth, if we did it right, the, uh, the two surfaces will meet and there will be no seam between them. And looking good. Sure enough, I can't feel any seam or lip or anything there, so that is delightful. Okay, we're done with the spindle center, so I will obtain consent and then tap it out from the back like so. Oh, and uh, I forgot to chamfer the ends of the arbor, so I had to go and put it back in the fore jaw and do that. Uh, this is especially important on the end that's going to get uh, inserted into the base because we're going to need a little help getting that aligned. Now recall that the surface finish on the top of this part was not winning any awards because that shell mill was getting dull. And uh, in fact, uh, it sat in the shop for, uh, for a little while uh, while this project was on hold and it kind of flash rusted because the surface finish wasn't very good. The worse your surface finish is, the faster things rust because moisture collects in the imperfections in the surface. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I took, t I took this guy to the uh, emery paper and uh, uh, cleaned up the surface a little bit, got that rust off of there, and uh, yeah, the surface is 20% less embarrassing now. Okay, now for the exciting part, we need to mate the arbor and the base. Now, you've seen me use my bench vise as an improvised arbor press quite a bit, but uh, a two thou press fit on a three quarter inch shaft is more than I'm comfortable uh, exposing my vise to in this way. So instead, we're gonna do some light metallurgy. Now, I'm sure you know that uh, you can heat metal up and it will expand, or you can chill it down and it will shrink. And uh, so we're going to use that technique here to install this. So you can find these thermal expansion calculators online, and this is one of those. And uh, it tells us that uh, we can put in our starting dimension and the dimension that we need and the expansion coefficient of the steel that we're using. And it tells us that we need a temperature delta of about 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the easiest way to do this operation would be to chill the shaft and make it smaller and then just insert it into the base. Uh, unfortunately, to get a temperature delta of negative 480 degrees, you're definitely going to need liquid nitrogen for that, and uh, that's not something I have access to. Uh, but it's a lot easier to get things hot than it is to get things cold, and uh, I do have access to an oven, and so from room temperature to 500 degrees should get us there, and luckily my kitchen oven can just barely do that. That's the maximum temperature that it will, that it will do. Uh, and so I uh, put our base in the oven and we're going to heat it up and expand it to fit over the arbor. And uh, so I left it in there for 35 minutes. Uh, longer is better. It's not going to get too hot because it's going to, you know, hold it at that temperature. And it is hard to know exactly, uh, you know, when it's that correct temperature all the way through the material. So if in doubt, leave it in longer. So then I hustled it back to the bench and uh, you got to be quick here because uh, that thing is 
at 500 exactly, which is the temperature we need. And uh, it's gonna start cooling off very quickly as soon as it comes out of that oven. And the hotter something is, the faster it cools off. So uh, we gotta hustle, uh, we don't have a lot of time. So I got my 10 degree angle block there to help me guide it in at the right angle. And uh, it seemed to go in uh, properly and I gave it some taps uh, with the brass hammer just to be sure. And then I let that guy cool off naturally and that base shrinks down around that arbor and uh, it is an incredibly, incredibly strong joint. Okay, so now we have one last operation, which is a very exciting uh, bit of turning. So we're gonna put the whole thing back in the four-jaw chuck and indicate that arbor in as close as we can. And uh, then we're gonna turn the entire outside of the base uh, down to final dimension. And this is gonna ensure that the whole thing is pretty much as concentric as we can possibly get it. Now, uh, my original vision for this was to actually turn the entire thing between centers after assembly like this, but the problem is because of where that slot is for the tool bit, there's nowhere for, uh, for a center to go in the base. Uh, it, it would be right on the edge. Even if you filled the slot with a piece of scrap, let's say, the, uh, the center would be right on that, uh, that, that crack and it just wouldn't be a very secure thing uh, to have holding the other end of the part. Uh, and it's also at a 10 degree angle. So there was a lot working against that. So I just decided to turn it as you see here. And uh, this actually worked uh, very, very well. All right, so this should be our finishing pass. And let's see how we did. And we're aiming for 2.5 inches, and we ended up at uh, 2.5 and a half a thou. So you know what? I will take that. All right, and we can't uh, unfortunately deburr anything on the lathe because all of these edges are at weird angles. So I took it off and uh, deburred it by hand. And uh, now we can install my set screws that I bought for this purpose. And uh, as I said, I, I intentionally chose ones that were the same size as used by my tool holders. So here's that Allen wrench and it's too small. So apparently I got the sizes wrong. Okay, so I went and got the big Allen wrench and that fits the bolts and uh, nope, actually the bolts don't go in. So the problem is I bought bolts that were too big. Imperial fist shake. Okay, well I wanna give this thing a test run. So I put in some longer set screws that I pilfered out of my uh, tool holders. So I get that uh, tool bit roughly centered. And uh, the, the goal here is to see how good uh, the balance is after all of that effort we did to make it balanced. Let's uh, see how well that actually worked. So I'm spinning it up slowly here, starting at 50 RPM. And we're working our way up and up and up. And I got all the way up to 800 RPM before I started to feel some vibration in the mill. And now 800 RPM is way, way faster than you would ever run a four inch fly cutter. So I actually feel really, really good about that. I think I can say that the uh, balancing trick that we did in Fusion 360 worked uh, really well. So now we can go ahead and grind the tool bit that uh, is actually gonna go in there. So this is a piece of uh, half inch uh, high speed steel that I got off McMaster. And so I'm grinding all of the facets that I'm gonna need in there. The nice thing is that the 10 degree angle of the fly cutter gives us one of our, our relief angles for free. So we don't have to grind as many faces as we would for a normal turning tool bit. Okay, so there's our final facets looking good. So I'm just gonna stone those guys a little bit to clean them up. And then I'm also gonna stone a little bit of a nose radius on there to hopefully improve the finish. Okay, that's looking good. All right, let's install this guy and give it a uh, test run. So I'm gonna install it here with the bit centered, which will be acting as a four inch diameter cutter effectively. So I'm starting it out at 100 RPM, which is uh, about right for a four inch cutter. And uh, this is 1018 steel, and you can see that uh, it's actually stalling the mill. So that's uh, an unfortunate limitation of a small mill like this, is they don't have a lot of torque down low. So uh, as is often the case with these hobby mills, uh, you have to run everything a little faster than you should uh, in order to get performance. So, uh, so now I'm running the, the cutter at 250 RPM, and uh, now it's actually cutting pretty well. So uh, I think this might be uh, about the right speed for it. But I think the real bottom line is that uh, I wouldn't 
really want to use it at the full four inch range on steel. Maybe save that for aluminum and brass and other things that are a little easier to cut. Okay, so that was kind of the worst case, but this is really a finishing tool. So let's set it up for success here and I'm going to face the top of this with the shell mill and uh, get it nice and flat. And then we're going to do a finishing pass and I'm going to set the fly cutter. I'm going to choke it up this time and uh, so this will end up being about uh, about two and a half, uh, maybe 2.6 inch uh, of uh, diameter on this cutter effectively. And uh, I'm running it about, again, 250 RPM. So that should be a good match of feed and speed. And speaking of feed, I've got my power feed set basically as slow as it will go. Uh, because as I've said previously, you know, fly cutters do very little cutting on each rotation because it's a single point and it's not spinning that fast. Uh, and you know, and of course the RPM is set not by how fast you'd like to cut, but by the surface speed of uh, the cutter relative to the material. You're again aiming for 100 or 150 uh, surface feet per minute for steel, so you don't get to choose your RPM. And so what you have to do is choose your feed to match the RPM, which is lower than you would like, so your feed has to be basically glacially slow for a fly cutter. Okay, so we've seen that fly cutters are not fast. They cannot take deep cuts. And uh, despite being a single point cutter at the full four inch uh, diameter, they uh, can still stall the mill for uh, poor benchtop uh, machinists like myself. So uh, that really le just leaves us with surface finish as the value proposition for the fly cutter. Uh, they, are, they do have the reputation of, of producing the best finishes, so let's see how we did in that regard. Now this is the fly cutter finish, and uh, looks very nice, but uh, this side was machined with the 2 inch shell mill that you've seen me use very much. So they both look pretty darn good. But let's go to the real truth teller, the macro lens. So this is the side that was cut with the milling cutter, and uh, you can see this kind of pilling here. Now this is invisible to the naked eye, but the macro lens reveals all, and uh, just for uh, perspective, this uh, pointer that you're seeing is uh, actually a sewing needle. Uh, that's, so that's the scale that we're looking at here. And uh, so you can actually feel this uh, little bit of bumpiness that you can see here. So uh, let's take a look at the fly cutter side. Now look at the fly cutter side. This is really remarkable. The finish is really quite noticeably better. There's none of that pilling that we saw and uh, you can feel that difference. Uh, this side is uh, is really, really glassy smooth, and the other side is feels very smooth, but you can feel just a little something, something, and it was that pilling that we saw earlier. So uh, this is probably the best surface finish that you're going to get, uh, you know, on a mill short of surface grinding. Uh, this is probably the best surface finish that uh, has ever uh, walked into my shop. In fact, I'm ruining it by scratching it with this needle. Uh, so this is quite remarkable. Okay, so I'm very happy with the results here. So uh, it's time to give this guy a finish. And uh, normally I would use something like uh, this Brownells Oxfo Blue and to give it an oxide black finish. But uh, I, I really like the look of this thing. I got uh, great finishes on all the parts. So uh, instead I'm gonna let it shine and leave it bright finish. And so here's an alternative. This is uh, Boshield T9 and uh, it's a kind of a, a waxy coating, uh, sort of a, a clear preservative for finished surfaces. So I use this on things like uh, the column on my drill press. If you've got a machined surface that isn't going to get a ton of use, this bow shield is, is really, really great. And you know, this fly cutter isn't going to get a ton of use. It's going to sit in my drawer most of its life. So uh, bow shield is a great uh, application here. Now I'll link to this stuff down in the description. It is not cheap, but a little of it goes a very long way. This tiny little can has lasted me five years. So you just spray it on really lightly and then uh, let it sit until it dries. And if there's, if you get too much on there, you can kind of uh, dab it a little bit. And uh, it leaves, like I said, kind of a waxy finish. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Hashtag not sponsored. Okay, so some final assembly. And there's a beauty shot of our final little fly cutter. Uh, this thing was a ton of fun to make and I'm really pleased with the finishes that it will achieve. I don't know if I'll ever actually use it very much, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a super fun thing to make. And uh, you know, when I was making that grinder rest uh, a little while back, I was just thinking to myself, man, this would be a really cool use for a fly cutter. I should really make a fly cutter. So eh, I made a fly cutter. Uh, I hope you enjoy watching it and uh, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.